makes a nicer, higher pitch sound. Nice. Um, oh, it does. Yeah. Uh, then the wooden one, uh, which we've been using mostly this year, a bit deeper. This is the best part of any podcast yeah. we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this. Talk sound test. <laughs> In episode 36 of the Whiskey and Things podcast, we're tasting not one, but two amazing whiskies from the independent bottler, Great Drams. And to tell us all about this company and the process by which they choose and create their whiskey, we have a special interview with their founder, Greg Dillon. As always, you can find some more whiskey-based content on all our social media platforms at Whiskey and Things Podcast on Instagram and at Whiskey and Things on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, as always, it'd really help us out if you rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on your favourite podcast platform. Don't forget to hit that share button. Do you believe in life after love? That's share, isn't it? Yeah. Do you believe in life after love? You're listening to the Whiskey and Things Podcast with Dave Giles and Nick Kent. Welcome to episode 36 of the Whiskey and Things Podcast. I'm Dave Giles. And I'm Nick Kent. How you doing, buddy? All How right. you doing? I'm all right, mate. How are you doing this week? Not too bad, not too bad. I'm trying to get a load of things set up, Nick, uh, for various various things. And on, on Sunday... Uh, I'm going to attempt a 12-hour live stream, believe it or not, on I Twitch. I can believe that. Jesus. Um, Twitch. Yeah. Have I got yeah, that? Yeah, trying, trying something new. That. So I'm going to be taking requests for songs for 12 hours. I'm going to try not to play the same song twice as well. We will see how we get on. But uh, yeah, Stay come, away. so this time, Stay this away. time next week, I may have no voice. I may oh, have good. no voice. Oh, good. Uh, good. But oh, well. we will see. You, you, may, you may be doing... Um, the intro on your own next week. I was going to say, yeah. I think most of next week's show we're recording tomorrow. Exactly, just as well. We'll let you know the about that at the, end of the, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the episode, people. But yeah, but this, yes. let's go on to this episode, Dave. Let's, let's. What have we got, Nick? Mate, mate, we are just knocking them out of the park recently. But another guest today, haven't we? Right, little backstory. We do. A few weeks ago, I went on a walk and checked out a craft market up here in Manchester. Nice. And I stumbled on a stall selling small batch whiskies. Oh, sublime. I know. Sublime. And after lockdown, mate, that was a jackpot, I tell you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I had a little chat with a guy who was working at the little oh, stall. Yeah. Uh, his name was Craig. Had a little taste of everything. And uh, I ended up walking away with a couple of bottles. Very nice. Very nice. The company was called, and still is called, Great Drams. And they're an independent bottler based up here in the Manchester area. So I thought it'd be cool to invite on the founder of the company, Greg Dillon to the show to have a little chat about the business and to help us taste a couple of his whiskies. Sounds good, mate. Sounds good. Yeah. So here we go. Whiskey bots roll out. Greg, welcome. Hey, chaps. How are we doing? Not too bad. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Really appreciate you being here today. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. You're, you're our first independent bottler we've had on oh, wow. the podcast. So I've got loads of questions about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before we get into the whiskey, um, Greg, you're an independent bottler, you're a cask broker, mm-hmm. you're an author, you're a YouTube whiskey reviewer. Which came first? Uh, well, also a brand consultant in the spirits industry as well. Um, oh, there you go. And, and kind of NPD consultant as well. Um, the, actually, the, the consultancy side came first. Uh, that's, that's kind of the, the thing that kicked it off. Uh, and it was whilst doing that, whilst working in-house, uh, at a couple of design agencies where they they specifically hired me for on like a freelance basis to uh, to land whiskey clients and then to service those accounts on the strategy side i uh, suddenly realized that i'm i'm kind of doing this for other people and and they're getting rich off it why do i not set up my own consultancy and see if it works and it did which was nice um and then it was about three years after that i think so about seven or eight years ago, I can't really remember the timelines, especially this year. It's all a bit warped, isn't it? Um, yeah. But the uh, a while ago, anyway, an, an indeterminate amount of years ago, uh, Great Drowns was set up uh, initially just as a, a humble whiskey blog uh, of three readers, myself, my wife, and my father-in-law, which was fabulous. Um, and nowadays, we get about 35,000 uh, readers a month, which is quite cool. Um, and uh, on the back of that, the book came along. Uh, so I published that a couple of years ago. And it's actually at the launch of that when my wife said to me, look, you've got yourself a whiskey website that's doing all right. You've got yourself a book, which some people seem to like, which is great. And why don't you have your own whiskey? 
And so that's when we released our first bottle and that's when she joined the company. Um, and so now we work together on all of that stuff. Uh, we're up to, I think, release 17 comes out next week. Wow. Quite cool. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a silly question to start with, because I pointed this out to Nick just before you came online. Um, your initials are GD. Is that where the, the great drams thing came from? You are the second person to have ever noticed that. Ah, oh, um, yes. <laughs> and it is not a silly question in the slightest. It is probably, uh, when the last person noticed it, I was absolutely made up that someone did notice it. So, uh, yeah, super chuffed with that. Well played, yes. mate. Um, it actually, that, the naming of it was the longest part of the whole process of setting can, the website yeah, up. I can imagine. Because it had to be GD. I really wanted that. And, um, and that took a surprising amount of time to get to. Well, it does exactly what it says on the tin, doesn't it? That's it. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes so, it's the simplest ones that actually work the best. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. So, so talk, talk us through how you became an, in, obviously you said you, you did all the other things and then mm. you, you said you were going to release uh, a, a bottle. Oh, well, I'll do my own whiskey. What is the process to become an independent bottler? You don't just say, Oh, I'm going to become, a, I'm going to make my own whiskey. Cause obviously you're not making the whiskey. You're, you're yeah. selecting exactly the whiskey right. and, and branding it. Correct. Yeah, so essentially we do, the easiest way to explain what independent bottlers do, or indie bottlers as we, we kind of normally call ourselves, um, is we do everything apart from distillation. So the maturing of the spirit, we select the casks. Um, for some of our releases, we choose to finish them in different um, different casks, different vessels. Others, uh, when it's the blended side, I create the recipe for all the blends and, and then using casks that we own uh, to then I kind of bring different flavor profiles together and so it is incredibly hands-on um which is awesome great fun yeah um, but to actually become one it's not easy in the slightest it's a uh a kind of i don't know a battle of wills against paperwork um hmrc interviews uh premise license personal license a thing stupidly named a wowger which you have to have otherwise there's not a chance you're doing what we do um and what's the other one awrs license uh I've probably forgotten a number of licenses that we have, but we have to have them. Um, and yeah, there's a hell of a lot of paperwork and admin. Um, but once you get past all that boring stuff, eventually, um, it is it's pretty simple after that. And like we select cars, we work with warehouses, distilleries, brokers, all kinds of people uh, that we trust and have had long-term working relationships with um, to select cars. If anything interesting comes along, it's somewhere between a fine, give me a sample or instinctively, I want that uh, yeah. invoice me now, please. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how it works. Uh, yeah. In a nutshell. Amazing. I'm, I'm guessing also it's, uh, it's quite heavy on the investment side from the start, right? You need to have a bit of capital behind you. Uh, yeah, you I'm, need I'm guessing to, um, where it helps you had the book and the, and the website going well beforehand. Yeah, for sure. You, you, it's not a cheap thing to get into by any stretch of the imagination, but, it is, uh, but then whiskey isn't at all. I mm -hmm. mean, to have a distillery, which initially is what I wanted um, a few years ago, uh, I wanted to have one in Ireland actually, but then the kind of startup costs were just ridiculous. So you're talking minimum of sinking a mill into, oh, wow. into that before you've even laid down stock. And then you've got three years to wait until you've got mm. the, the youngest mature stock that you yeah, could ever yeah. bottle. And that's just not great news for us. So uh, doing the bottling route is what actually ended up I think I've preferred doing this anyway because it means that uh, specifically how we have set our business up and as you said of like the knock do and, and like the Christmas release and all the other ones that we have uh, every single release we produce is limited edition so mm. when it sells out it will never ever be repeated again and that is a, a kind of founding principle of the business and that was mostly because selfishly, it's more interesting for me <laughs> if yeah. we are doing different things and I'm playing with different casks uh, instead of uh, hawking the same kind of 12-year-old X, Y, Z for forever, you know. Um, so it gives us something new to talk about. And actually, our loyalist customers, or most loyal customers, um, are the ones who have made sure that, or kind of told us effectively, that that's the reason that they are loyal to us. It's because yeah. we have different releases always. And as soon as they're announced, we actually have a WhatsApp group, a private one for um, our kind of top tier uh, customers who are mostly now friends anyway. And uh, and they get alerted weeks before we publicly talk about any new releases. 
um because they they all have like specific bottle numbers that they want and all mm. different things so we try and do what we can to to make it the best experience possible for for the people that we're producing this for yeah yeah at the whiskey show recently we discovered about independent bottlers i'd heard of them but it was the first time i'd actually figured out what what the deal was and it dawned on me that if you're a whiskey fan Mm. getting to know an independent bottler is probably the best thing you could do because you're going to be from someone you trust you're going to be given and exposed to lots of unique whiskies which mm. you're not going to get anywhere else and you're going to have a new thing to try every six months year whatever it however often that yeah. bottler gets something out uh, and it's always going to be something new and interesting because you're not going to get the, the same thing over and over again like yes by Agreed. all means have that doesn't mean you can't have your bottle of uh glen livet reserve on the side that's your kind of daily whiskey but you also have your your special whiskeys but you can have your special time with nick um <laughs> uh that, that are different and unique and and when people come around you'll be like you want to try this you're not going to get this anywhere else and all those kind of things that you get uh yeah. at, and as a whiskey affectionado, that's that's fun. That's a fun part of that world. Yeah, and also, I mean, we we have a uh, like a, a, another private thing that we do that we don't talk about. Uh, it's just a group of people um, that you know they it, pretty much exactly what you just said. We create releases just for them as well, so they never get uh, talked about publicly. They mm. they never get even mentioned on the website or our YouTube or social or anything. They are purely private releases for these guys and what we also do actually we did um um a chap's 50th birthday we created a whiskey uh, just for him um we're doing one that or two at the minute uh, for two different people in singapore um and we create small like actually sorry one other guy uh we've just done his wedding whiskey as well uh, so he's giving 20 cl bottles as the wedding favors Nice. And then uh, having the bigger ones to actually enjoy on the day and in one for the archive, I guess. But so we do lots and lots of different things, which um, basically if we, we never say no. <laughs> so if someone has an idea <laughs> of what they want to do, I'll work out a way of doing it and, yeah. um, and normally have a lot of fun along the way. <laughs> How do you get into that club for the exclusive whiskies then? Uh, I can drop you a note afterwards, mate. Not a problem. <laughs> really. Not a problem. <laughs> You're listening to the Whiskey and Things podcast. What do you prefer? Do you prefer making a blend or do you prefer thinking about finish for a single malt and, and presenting a single Ooh. malt? Uh, the finishes are a lot scarier because uh, you never, ever, ever know exactly how that's going to go. And the first time we did it with the Craig Ellicke, I was bricking it, like truly bricking it. Because um, it was already a fantastic whiskey that was 10 and a half years old. And then I'd had this first fill Oloroso Sherry Cast made specifically for finishing because um, I felt like I should indulge myself a little bit. <laughs> and, <I wanted that. laughs> and, um, and then after like, after like just four weeks, it had taken so much character and flavor and color. I'm like, Christ, you can't have a four week finish. That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, so I then got scared that I was going to over finish it by accident and com completely screw the pooch. So I ended up getting samples sent down from the warehouse team like every few days, which was overkill, but I didn't know any better at the time. And they must've been so annoyed. Um, but hey, that's the nature of their gig. And eventually at six months, I was like, no, this, I think this has gone far enough now. It's, this is um, part of the checklist is for every single release. Would I personally buy an entire mm. case of it? And if the answer is yes, then that's that's the big tick at the end. Um, but then when creating the blends, they're also incredibly fun because you don't necessarily know where that's going to go either. Like everything starts on a post-it note, genuinely on a post-it note, stuck to my laptop, and I effectively stare this thing out for a few weeks, working out what the hell I'm going to do with it. Um, it's like a flavor brief. And um, then eventually it gets mapped onto this mega spreadsheet thing that we use to track all the casks, the amount of milliliters that are left in everything and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then start working out which casks work together to create certain flavor profiles to answer that flavor brief, get the sample sent down uh, from the team up in, uh, up in Scotland and uh, then start literally like a GCSE chemistry set pilot blending just kind of uh, in the office. Um, Amazing. It, it really is. It's so basic, <laughs> but at the same time, it is like, it's the raw fun of it. Right. Um, mm. and then so do lots of different pilots if, and then we leave them for a few days to marry and to twine all that lovely stuff. And if they're working, nudge them forward. If not, they get sent to the house for cocktails and stuff. 
and um, <laughs> then the uh, the kind of the ones that eventually get to the end uh, occasionally get shared with other people. Like the first time we did a blend, I shared it with the actual pilot. I must have shared with about fifty people at different whiskey clubs around the UK to get feedback, and then their feedback actually did help shape the end flavour, which was quite cool. Uh, the second time we were under a lot of time pressure, so I wasn't able to quite do that. Um, but then when you send that email of like, I need X amount of mill of this, X amount of this, X amount of that into, uh, into this blend, um, and then bottled once it's ready. Um, that's really quite nerve wracking as well. Cause that's the point where, when that palette arrives, eventually, uh, you're like, huh, will anyone else like this? <laughs> and yeah. if the answer is no, <laughs> you're a little bit screwed. Um, but thankfully it, like the last one, especially the blend two did incredibly well. And we're down to our last, as of like, as of this morning, we're down to our last 12 of those, I think. Oh, wow. And, wow. uh, batch three sold out uh, about two months ago and release four, which is a very small, uh, run of 50 bottles of blended world whiskey. Um, that's got one left and it's on the shelf in the storeroom. Um, and then it's gone, done and dusted forever. And we're already thinking about release five. Yeah. How far ahead do you plan your releases? Like let's say one you're doing now, when will that come out? Um, that's a great question. It really, really depends. Um, so uh, in normal years, <laughs> we plan quite a few months in advance. Um, in Because uh, things take ages. So typically to do a blend and get it done properly, uh, it would take about six months from start to finish um, with piloting, testing, bottling, labeling, all that, and the quality control, all that, all that fun stuff. Um, single cast can be a lot quicker because uh, if the sample, like we get sample sent of all of ours every few months just to make sure everything's ticking along nicely. And uh, if one is standout, that is ready. It's got to be bottled now. Like the Nocdoo yeah. was exactly like that. Um, then I will fill out the paperwork. Again, quite a nice boring task, but you have to do it. Uh, send that off uh, to the team uh, to authorize an HMRC and duty tax, all that stuff. And um, then that normally will be about an eight week turnaround once the paperwork's done. Right. So right. Um, yeah, you have to plan quite far in advance. Um, at the minute it's quite tricky because with this year, things have been good for us actually um, on, on those fronts. And we've been selling out uh, quicker um because everyone's at home just getting smashed but the, uh, <laughs> at, at the same time it's we've done smaller batches because at the exact same time we don't know how anything's going to play out um yeah. so we didn't want to have one release and then you know all of a sudden everything turns around again and it's with us for a year because that doesn't make any sense for us to have that uh, happen uh, yeah um so yeah it's it's a trickier it's a tricky scenario to manage truth be told but still the last page of the uh, business plan uh, when I was convinced my wife this was a great idea was at absolute worst literally a big font last page at absolute worst we drink it so, yeah I'm the same I've got all lo- I've got my own blends of tea and it's exactly the same worst case scenario I'm drinking all this tea it's yeah. not a bad <laughs> it's not actually yeah. that bad of a bad exactly. of a, a thing I'm always going to need tea in the house so why not <laughs> you know that's it man yeah what's well, yeah. good as well I mean you're talking about this year being a bit weird people are also looking for a bit of a treat when they do go out yeah and i know when i went out to buy these i think i'd seen your stall before up in okay. you know media city and i'm not gonna lie i kind of went out wanting to come back with something you know <laughs> something a bit special and then um yeah and then the, there you guys were so people you know it was socially distanced market is all good everyone yeah um but yeah, I just kind of just wanted to get out and kind of mix with people a bit more because that hasn't been happening and to actually get yeah. something local. Because you, where, where are you guys based? Uh, actually in Poynton, just south of Manx. So yeah, Poynton. So right kind of dead centre between Stockport and Macclesfield, really. So yeah, it was a, people want to kind of support their local businesses as well. So that's the way I kind of saw it yeah. as well. Uh, so, um, and we've, we've been hugely appreciative of people who have, have done that. I mean, we're we're quite passionate local business folk as well. Like we, as far as we can, we always try and buy local and really put the graft into doing that. And um, yeah, it's not always cheaper or anything, obviously, but at the same time, you're supporting real people instead of anonymous yeah. kind of uh, yeah. shareholders, I guess. But Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I've got one other question. Obviously, once you make the whiskey, for me, I imagine one, if I was doing your job, I think one of the fun things I would, I would do, and I imagine Nick would be the same, is the packaging. Mm. so that they're yeah. making the label and the bottle and how you're presenting the whiskey 
who's in charge of that? Is that your job or is that, uh, do, you, do you outsource that? Uh, how much pride do you take in that? Because that is the face, you know, it, it, that will sell a lot it of is, things yeah, yeah. for you. It's important. It's the silent brand ambassador is what we call it. Oh, and nice. um, the, uh, and so what, basically when it comes down to it, uh, it's all the content that goes in there. So that's what the full on the knock do. Sorry. That's what the full label will look like on the larger yeah. size, each individually numbered, we do our best with transparency as well. So distilled date, bottle date, even the cask number is on yeah. there, although the light is glaring that right out of my view anyway. There you go. Yeah, we got that. Uh, then each side of the boxes, you have um, uh, information about the distillery. And on the back, the uh, flavor profile and why I chose to bottle each release. Uh, so it is very much from me to everyone who gets it. Um, the packaging is actually designed by a company called Stranger and Stranger, um, who have design studios in London, New York, and San Francisco, um, and have been awarded the world's best design agency for, I think it's eight or nine years in a row wow. now. Um, so those are the guys who, who make these, these things look lovely. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And, and when you're choosing your bottles, Nick, can we, is it, it's cork, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One of our favourite things is the cork the sound. sound. We too. love, we yeah, we love getting it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when did you get to choose your bottles and cork thing? And did you do a did you do a, a sound test? Uh, um, <laughs> in choosing your in yeah, choosing we, your bottle, it's not yeah, tight no, enough. Totally. We, it's not we, tight we, enough, guys. <laughs> Gonna cork a bit bigger. Uh, we do get to choose everything. The whole thing's up for grabs. Even down the um, down to the foiling. Uh, I prefer black because I'm not really a gold kind of person. Um, and I prefer the matte finish versus all the shiny. So that's mm-hmm. kind of what we do. Um, but apart from that, it's all, all relatively standard, really. The corks are, uh, so we use Oslo bottles, which are the classic uh, spirits shaped bottle. Uh, so similar to monkey shoulder, although they have, they have the monkeys pressed into it mm. on the top yeah. right shoulder. Um, so it's basically the same bottle. They just have theirs decorated. Um, and a number of other spirits use our bottle. So it's not unique in that. Until we're much, much bigger, then maybe we'll do a unique bottle, <laughs> but I don't <laughs> necessarily feel that we need to do that. Um, and so with that, you have a number of options with uh, corks and closures and stuff. And uh, we actually rotate around a little bit. So it depends on what we're doing. So actually we had a, a plastic topped one here for our yeah. Gervin about two years ago, which actually makes a nicer, higher pitch sound. Nice. Um, and then oh, we have the wooden one. Yeah. Uh, then the wooden one, uh, which we've been using mostly this year, bit deeper um and then we do i don't think i've got any with this me is at the, the best part of any podcast yeah. we've ever done <laughs> <laughs> i'm loving this um <laughs> and then we use a now we use a conglomerate one which is kind of a black plasticky type thing with a cork and it actually is a lot stiffer to get out um so yeah we, we mix them out a little bit yes, yes it's exactly. quick. Good. yeah Excellent. big time yeah. Uh, Nick, have you got anything else before we start tasting the first one? Or um, I was going to ask: um, Do you just deal in scotches, or are you do you do Irish and Ooh, English and Welsh? Good question. And- um, so we're we're constantly on the hunt for new and interesting, fun things. That's that's a given, really. Um, we have been working our socks off to get an Irish since pretty much day day two, um, <laughs> and it's a lot trickier than you could imagine. Um, <laughs> a surprising amount more regulation and paperwork um on top of all the stuff we already had to do so kind of pause it until we until we have it access elsewhere um we also were in talks to do an indian one and a welsh one wow um but it's just it's a really slow progress it's not they're not set up like so scotch has um within how the the industry is set up every blender um so they're basically all this you everyone talks about distilleries and single malts and they're the holy grail or whatever the origins of Scotch are around blending and blending flavor profiles together to create balance and harmony and stuff. And so it's mostly blending houses that you'll see own most of the distilleries nowadays. And because of that, they actually in the, like traditionally, and they still do it to this day, they have between them all like filling contracts and uh, swap deals. So they quite literally will swap a tanker of spirit from X distillery for a tanker of spirit from Y distillery and they'll go past each other on the road almost. It's that kind of uh, thing. Um, But because of that, it means that there's a a built-in market for third-party ownership, which means that's how brokers like us work and how bottlers like us work. Whereas in Ireland, it's not quite the case. Uh, Distilleries are not, uh, they're not traditionally 
uh, geared up to sell on the kind of the private dark market or whatever you call it. I don't know um, <laughs> that we would in Scotland. Um, they normally make their product themselves and don't really use other people's products. There was until only like four or five years ago, there was only about four active distilleries in Ireland uh, with mature spirit, loads of brands, loads of products, but all coming from four, uh, maybe five max distilleries. Um, so they didn't need to trade with anyone. Whereas in Scotland, they've always had to. Mm. And, uh, and because of that, it's, a, it's actually a different market where we would have access because all the license and everything gets you through the door. And in my connections with the industry from working with people there for well over a decade now, if not, God, probably nearly 15 years, geez. Um, but it's, uh, that's how you kind of do it. So for us, it's easier to get scotch, um, but we are working on the others at some point, <laughs> that's for sure. This is the Whiskey God, reminding you to please always drink responsibly. Right, so we uh, should we crack on with the knock do? Yes, yeah, man. It's, it's nearly a quarter to noon, and we have another a swig yet. Oh yeah. Oh wow! Oh, that, wow! 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 I know. Um, I know. I know. Right. Yeah. What we got here then? So this is uh, the knock do. Yeah. Um, single cask series, single malt scotch from Speyside. It's uh, yeah. forty-eight point two ABV. Tell us about this one. Sure, man. So it's actually a full-term maturation in that first fill Ruby Port Barrique. Uh, so it's not a finish. It is a full-term uh, maturation. Okay. And what you <laughs> notice from it is uh, there you go, nice squeak. Um, nice what you notice from it is that uh, you have almost like a rosé colour to it. Yeah, totally. yeah, I definitely won't see that in my glass, but in yours, you <laughs> should see it. Um, the, uh, and that rosé colour should uh, kind of, well, it all has come from the cask. So everything we do is natural colour as well. We don't add anything to it. We, uh, it's all very, very natural and transparent in how we do things. Um, and so the big key notes from this guy should be that rich flavour profile, but then also the chocolate and the berry notes as well. It will yeah. track through from the nose through to the actual palate. On the nose, that's such, I mean, that's Fruity. incredible on the nose, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Mm. Wow. That is that dark forest gato again, Nick. <laughs> dark forest. Thank you. Yeah. Black well, well, what, what, what is it? What am I supposed to have said there? Well, no, you can say whatever you want, Dave. It's your note. <laughs> yeah, you say what you need to, man. Don't worry about it. Yeah, what, what do you normally <laughs> call it? It's the one that you always say. Black forest. Black forest, that gato. There it is. <laughs> it is that, isn't it? It's that combination mm. of, of, of yeah. fruits and chocolates and and cream. Uh mm. it, yeah. Wow. Oh yeah, that's such an experience on the nose. Yeah, the palate as well. It's just fruity, spicy. Oh, very pleasant. Thank you. Very pleasant. Yeah, I was particularly happy with this one. Um, yes, yeah, so we only, only got 183 bottles uh, from the cask, um, but absolutely superb release. It was launched at the end of, sorry, beginning of uh, September, and then yeah, sold out uh, two days ago. So pretty swift turnaround, really, for mm. a full release. Yeah. Um, especially as that's both sizes. Like normally it would be the big ones sell out quicker every time and then the smaller ones kind of chug away for a little bit after. Um, but yeah, this one's just flown. Did this have worm tubs in the uh, equation? Is that right? Yeah. Right yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, worm tubs are the really old school um, uh, type of condenser. Uh, they were most, most places started with them, but then they, they kind of got rid because they worked out that it's actually 27 times more expensive to run worm tubs than the more modern condenser. Mm. Um, And they're huge. It takes up real estate as well. Oh God, yeah. Um, I've seen them, I've actually seen them twice in the wild and one of which was at the Craig Ellicke Distillery and it's massive. And it is literally like a swimming pool with copper tubes going up and down, hence why it's called worm tubs. Uh, Very descriptive in a, the whole production method, really. Um, but yeah, they, uh, <laughs> uh, but that creates a much thicker spirit because you're getting increased copper contact because um, you're getting it not just in the still, the line arm, and then coming through, but then through the whole condensing process. Mm. Um, so it thickens up that spirit, gives it a more meatier character. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's yeah, meatier is a good good shout. Actually, I found it's it's quite a dense whiskey, isn't it? It's, there's, it's quite heavy. In a good yeah. way, though. Not, not. I don't oh, mean yeah. that in a negative way. But it's there's a, a, a you feel it in your mouth. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> and and, it, and there's a lot to it. It's a richness to it as well. A real richness to this one. Mm. Yeah, we um, were very happy with this. We actually released. Uh, so we bought this cask um, a couple of years ago and uh, released a small amount of it for that private group that I told you about. The cask mm-hmm. strength uh, version in the mid fifties, I think, maybe fifty five or fifty four ABV. 
And when doing that, I it's one of those where I kept going back to it and I was like, this is really, really good. Um, and I was like, I wasn't going to release this as a, as like its own product for either quite a while or at all, really. We we're going to use it in blends and various other things to kind of give a thicken up the, the, the kind of recipe and, and add the mouthfeel and texture. And then I just couldn't get away from how much I loved it. So as soon as it ticked over to be eight years old, got the cast, the last cast sample was still blown away. So authorized it the same day, I think, to just get mm. bottled. Yeah. Um, yeah. Made total yeah. sense. No, that's fantastic. That's, it's, it's really fantastic. Yeah. I'm glad you gave me a couple of samples of this one, Nick, because it means I've yeah, still got another two. one I, I can have. Two yeah, drams. I, I do appreciate Ooh. that a lot. Oh, uh, thank you. Out of a 20. I know, how generous. How generous. I know. Hey, you're good. You're going to regret that later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as this one I think has, he already does. Yeah, I do. As this one has sold out, we were going to keep the tasting for with the batch two for our patrons, but because this is sold out, I think we should taste it now so our listeners do hear something they can actually buy. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Can you, uh, yeah, talk us through your blended batch number two, please? So it actually includes some of this, doesn't it? It does indeed. It includes part of that seven-year-old uh, version of it I told you. And that, that's the other cork style, by the way, that you've got in there. Um, <laughs> if you wanted to get back to the, <laughs> uh, the, the cork geekiness. Um, the, uh, it includes, it only, so it's declared as a seven-year-old because legally you have to declare the, the youngest age in any blend. Mm. Uh, so the youngest age component that's in there. Be it a blended scotch, be it a single malt, which are blends, but they're blends from one distillery. Um, the uh, the youngest age has always got to be declared, uh, which dates back to when blenders used to declare that something was a 25 year old, even if it had literally a teaspoon of 25 year old whiskey in it. And then mm. then the uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association and lawmakers got involved. They they wheeled out the suits and just said, not so much. That's not cool. Um, <laughs> so out of consumer protection, all that, which is the right thing to do. Yeah. And so we try and put an age on every single thing we produce. Actually, the only one we haven't put an age on so far is our world blend. Um, every single other release has had a, an age right from five years old up to 30. Um, and yeah, so this one's seven years old. And the seven-year-old component, which is the Knock Doom, is only, uh, only makes up about 11% of the actual blend. Um, but it's still, we, you have to declare it in that. Yeah. And um, the rest of it is a 13-year-old from the North British Grain Distillery. And then also an 11-year-old from the Glen Murray Distillery um, in Speyside. Um, so in doing that, uh, like I mentioned earlier about how I create the blends, I've uh, got the th three car samples sent down. And actually the North British is the only consistent one from pilot one to end product. Um, the other two just were not working for me at all. I like, produced decent enough whiskeys, but not what I wanted. Right. Um, so a different car samples sent down and then worked out that putting these three together meant that the North British brought that kind of that creaminess and that beginnings of the vanilla note that you should get there. Um, and then just the smoothness in character. Then the Glen Murray layered on all those orchard fruits, those apples, that kind of pairy note that comes through and even more kind of more fresh, like ice creamy vanilla actually. Mm. And then the uh, knock do brought in the berries, which would have, uh, you don't you can't necessarily taste the berry notes, but they weirdly enough enhance the orchard fruit character from the Glen Murray. Um, so all layers and layers together to create the whole yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah, it's a lot. It's it's quite light as well compared to the um, yeah the Nocturne. Yeah, even though uh, it the it. the Glen Murray and the North British were both uh, first fill ex bourbon casks, and uh, the Nocturne is the only one that had like a deeper colour right. uh, from being the port cask. Mm -hmm. um, and so you often find the bourbon casks are much lighter anyway. Like our um, I think where is it? Our Gervin. I mean, that was a, oh, I can't really see with the light. You but, can. Wow. Yeah. Quite that's, light. That's, yeah, it's almost um, like an elderflower if you put that, press. Put that next to the knock yeah, do, it's quite completely. a contrast. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this one we always describe as being like monumentally smooth, but with all those fruity notes and that vanilla note um, being those two kind of key uh key flavor profiles yeah really getting the the, the vanilla and and the orchard fruits as you said the pears and the apples you can mm. really you can really get that it's really mm. uh mm. awesome really, oh, yeah, no, it's, anyway, uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna have a have a taste of this uh bottled at 46 two this one so we our blends are normally at 46 two and our single casts are normally at 48 two um so because of a bit more mouthfeel with the higher abv for the single cast yeah um and yeah only 250 bottles of this one ever made where is it? There we go. Um, that's that guy right there. And yeah, we have just 12 of these left. And then that one's done and dusted. That's so smooth. Cheers, man. 
That is really nice. Yeah, I could drink that all day long. Blending whiskey must be so hard. <laughs> must be so yeah. hard to do. Sorry, hey? Blending <laughs> whiskey must just be oh, an yeah. absolute mission. It is, because you can you can put anything together and technically create a blend, but to create, create one that, A, is what you want, um, but B, stands up as a quality product is actually seriously hard. Um, and I know we, we shouldn't really mention a certain biblical publication anymore, but the... Uh, the uh, the scores came in uh, oh, with yeah. that one this year, and um, uh, this this blend actually got eighty nine point five out of one hundred. So we were pretty chuffed with that because so we, we had two other scores in there. One was ninety two point five, and one was ninety four. So wow. it's doing all right. Um, yeah, we we actually we're sitting on uh, a couple of these boxes that Shivas make of like mm. blend blending sets yeah. oh yeah 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 um we're good to, we we're gonna try and do our first attempt do it man do, it. do you know what? It's, uh, that is such a cool set i got sent one of them uh for christmas by them a couple of years ago and it was so much fun yeah um, and i've done a couple of their live sessions as well and it is cool i like yeah. it i think what they've done with that actually in turning it into something that when people either gift it or buy it for themselves gives people a bit more of an appreciation about how hard it is <laughs> to create to make a, a good, good whiskey. Yeah, a, a good yeah. blend. Um, my only advice when you do do it, by the way, a little bit of smoke goes a surprisingly long oh, way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Noted. No, Noted. I did the tasting at the whiskey show, and I, I think I was the only one watching who actually had the set, and I was actually blending <laughs> along with it. But there's things you yeah. don't think about. You think you're just blending tastes, but you're not. There's one whiskey in particular. It's there to give you the creamy mouthfeel. You know, that's yeah. that's the... Yeah. That's what that's in there for. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was talking about with using the uh, the port cask for for that mouthfeel within this this uh, blend. It was yeah. predominantly for the texture yeah. that it was used, um, and not just the the flavour side of it. Yeah, it's got to be a lot of fun trial and error all of that out. That's got to be so much fun. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah, when we did our first blend on on the pod, I can't remember. Probably ten or ten or fifteen shows ago now. I can't remember. Mm. I was saying how in my head before we started this journey of learning about whiskey properly blends were the bad whiskeys <laughs> in this because you, you, you know it's your bells cheap, and coke at cheap, party yeah right? exactly the <laughs> cheap stuff that you yeah isn't it yeah. when you're a student which, which yeah. it, I've just got such bad memories of that to me that I, I was like oh blends oh don't give me a blend no thanks I, <laughs> do you know but, a lot but, of people are like that um, but you've got to remember that in the Scottish whiskey world uh, roughly 91.2% of the entire Scotch whiskey market is uh, volume, that is, of bottles bought and drank is blended Scotch. Yeah. yeah. And that accounts for about 74, 76% of the market value. Um, so without blends, there wouldn't be any whiskey, whiskey market. Yeah. world anyway. Completely. So it's been any other thing. I once like Johnny Walker, uh, Johnny Walker Black specifically. Um, and now Red, I guess, has got a lot of cultural significance around the world as well. Um, but then you've got big guys like Dewars, who I absolutely love, Valentines, Shivers, they do some interesting things. Uh, then the old school, like Haig, White Horse, White and Mackay, um, Black and White, surprising amount of brands with white in it, and I'm looking at the shelf. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, they're all doing really cool and interesting things as well. Um, and like with Dewars especially, like they, they just released a Mezcal finished uh, whiskey after doing a rum cast finish. And it's, you know, it's just cool stuff, you know. Yeah, I just I just need to drop that stigma in my head of oh, it's a blend, therefore it's substandard. That's not yeah. the case at all. There's just I cheap think they're whiskeys. more exciting if anything because yeah, you yeah, have complete it's, it's freedom just... to do whatever. Yeah, you know, you and also they're the harder products to create because yeah. when it comes to um, say if it comes to like a uh, a blended Scotch, right? Well, a, a traditional heritage blend. Like take teachers for example, which in this country is not really given much love, um, but in India. It is one of the top whiskies you can buy. Um, and it's a real symbol of progress if you're owning that. And then in Brazil, that same whiskey is seen as a good time to have with friends, with coconut water and that kind of stuff. Um, and then in, in, in other parts of the world, it's, it's a very aspirational whiskey. But you've got to think that from a blender's perspective, I was saying earlier, they trade tankers, they trade spirit and all this kind of stuff. Some years you won't have enough volume to trade distillery X with distillery Y. So they have to use distillery Z to get that same volume in. So you're getting different inputs, but it's the skill of the blender to intertwine all of those different uh, kind of disparate strands of flavor to create the same flavor as last year. Um, yeah. oh, and yeah. that's the real skill and the real challenge. Um, I, I've 
good friend of mine is the master blender for the famous grouse, uh, Callum Fraser. And the, the kind of, um, the biggest challenge is the stuff that no one want, really wants to talk about, which is consistency and not screwing yeah. it up. <laughs> that is basically <laughs> the, the number one job like description is don't screw this up. Um, and uh, then you can do your innovation, all the fun stuff, fine. But Heartland has to be straight as a die every time. Yeah. And I guess for you, you don't have to worry about that because nope. you're intentionally <laughs> not trying to do the same thing every time. Exactly. So therefore, yeah. you don't have to, you don't have to, as you're starting a new thing, you, you've got a completely clean palette. Yes, so, indeed. Indeed. Oh, Nicely yeah. done. Um, yeah. And we can do car blanche every single time. It's uh, something different, which is quite cool. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Greg. This has been wonderful. These whiskeys are great. And I will definitely be looking out for more great dram stuff. Uh, awesome, myself uh, because yeah this this was wonderful or, or may, maybe just send Nick down to the market more once <laughs> I was going to say yeah but no thank you guys thanks for taking the time to chat to me and uh, I've I've actually really enjoyed the, the whole session but also the, oh, the questions uh, uh, having to uh, having to actually think about a few things about uh, how we started and all that stuff I haven't had to think about that for a while so very cool thank awesome. you guys very very much well, well, ho- hopefully we'll see you in the real world sometime as well indeed that would be glorious I'd like that You're listening to Whiskey and Things. These British people talk funny. So, thanks very much to Greg Dillon. I had the best time then. That was so much fun. Mate, I am genuinely delighted with that segment. That was that was wonderful, wasn't it? What G- a lovely guy. GD, uh, GD joke. Don't worry about it. it okay. It, yeah, I mean, ble- the poor guy, he'd been he'd been up since 5am with his kid or 3am, something like that, hadn't he? He told yeah. us that he'd, he'd been up. So, it was great that he actually found some time to, and gave us the energy uh and answered all our questions so wonderfully. So, yeah, it was a great interview. Thanks very it much, was great. Greg. And I learned a new word, Dave. Barique. Oh, yeah. Barique. A ruby port barique. Yeah. Yeah. We were wondering, I or still, I was wondering how you pronounce that word. I so, still don't know. I still don't know what it is. Or <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a type of wine barrel that originated uh, in Bordeaux. It traditionally nice. holds 225 litres or 59 gallons. Dave. So there we go. So I thought lovely. Today. Yeah. Lovely. Barique. barique. Lovely. What a lovely word. Barique. Boudique. Hmm. If only I could roll my R's. I feel that's a moment where you want to be able to roll your R's. Oh, Boudic. I can't, yeah, but I've never been able to roll my R's. Me either. Fun fact there. Me either. Fun fact. Me. If uh, someone wants to record themselves with some high audio, rolling an R and saying <laughs> Boudic, uh, we'll be sure to put it in soon. Definitely. <laughs> that will make it. Yes. That will make it into so somehow. Maybe a sting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, <laughs> um, you can head over to greatdrams.com to find out more about great drams and what they have to offer the knock do single malt is sadly out of stock damn oops we did it again we tried though in fairness we, we did week, try it was a week out yeah yeah i mean we tried hard we, we nearly made that happen a week before but it didn't so uh yeah see you gotta get them quick just shows how quick you gotta get in there with these kind of yeah, bottles. Yeah, yeah. yes um but on their site, they do have the blended batch number two from the blended cask series that we did try. Now, that's Indeed. about uh, 25 quid for a 20 CL bottle or 45 for a 50 CL. Um, and they have loads of other whiskies on there, as he was describing. On there yeah, well. uh, as I said in the interview, and as I said after the whiskey show, I really do see the benefit of getting to know an independent bottler. So, so but... but it probably isn't a bad shout. If you're in the market to find some interesting whiskies, is to try and find an independent bottler. And why not treat yourself to one of the small twenty CL, smaller twenty CLs uh, bottles of one of their one of their blends or one of their whiskies, and just see see what you like. Yeah. And seeing if you like what they're doing, and maybe get a couple of them, and then you can decide whether this is something you're going to look out for in future for their future releases. Because um, I, I certainly am now on the hunt for for an independent bottler that, that's going to give me something unique and independent and, and that may not last very long. I really like that idea. I think it's wonderful. Um, but, of course, we had to edit out some of that interview. Uh, as always, we do like to talk and talk and talk and get our guests to talk and talk and talk. But you can watch the full uncut video of that interview with Greg over on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash whiskey and things. Uh, so please uh, go and check that out. We've got a load of other stuff that goes up on there as well. Um, so just go over and check it out. And uh, if you want to support the show, it's much appreciated. It's much appreciated. And thank you to the patrons who have already signed up. Exactly, exactly. Of course, Nick, some people might not want to make a monthly contribution to the show, and we understand that. Times are hard. But if you do like what we're doing, please consider 
maybe dropping us a donation on our website or going to buy some merchandise. Talking of which, Nick. Yeah, we're, we're still doing a cheeky little discount. That's right. We're offering a 20% discount off merch on our website until November the 30th. Just enter the code Black Friday 20 at the checkout to get a great discount on Whiskey and Things, Glen Karen's hoodies, T-shirts, um, Dave's Dandruff, um, <laughs> some old beer mats on there. Might be able to, you know, flog yep. as well. Um, yep. yep, yep, yep. Small print, they are not available. But uh, <laughs> mess- message me privately. That kind yeah, of yeah. We, I'm sure, sure Nick can sort you out with all of that stuff. <laughs> Um, if you message him on Twitter, he's all very active on Twitter. I'm very as we active all know. on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you can also buy Nick's Twitter password on uh, on the whiskey and things because you'll yeah. probably have better use for his Twitter account than he does. Yeah. Anyway, what's coming up next week, Nick? <laughs> we got the humdinger. Wow! Right, you thought us tasting two whiskeys this week was great, right? Next week we're going to be tasting three. Get out of town. What's going on? I know, right? What's going on here? It's Christmas, mate. It's coming up. I can feel it. It really is. It yeah, really yeah, is. It re- literally is. Um, yeah, we're going to be tasting three special Christmas releases from the Whiskey Exchange. Nice. Mm, and to make the show even better, <laughs> we've got the Whiskey Exchange's very own Billy Abbott coming on. Billy to- Abbott! Billy Abbott. Yeah! He's coming on to taste them with us and to tell us oh, all good old Billy. about them. The man, the myth, the beard is coming <laughs> on next week. So yeah, Billy. Billy does a lot of tasting videos online um, for Whiskey Exchange and a bunch of other things. And he was the guy we were tasting along with on our Instagram TV tastings a few weeks ago. I'm I'm really excited about this. I'm really excited, excited about getting to, getting to uh, spend some time with Billy over a Zoom call and uh, and drink some whiskey with him. It's going to be fun. Will be fun. Will be going to be fun. fun. Anyway, thank you to everyone uh, for listening. Uh, please don't forget to do the old uh, sh- press the share button, and uh, and if there's a chance, if there's an opportunity to give us a rating or a review, please consider it. Yes, consider it. Yes, thank uh, you. it really really does help us out. So, uh, but yeah, most importantly, thanks for getting to this point of the show because uh, it means you've just listened to all the sales pitches. Yeah, and are still here. <laughs> and are we still should do here. the what's on next week before the sales pitches. <laughs> Maybe we, we should. We might just Maybe restructure we should. that part of the show. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> well, let's discuss that at a later time, Nick. Unless <laughs> unless people like this part of the podcast yeah. where we discuss Sorry, how to do no it better. Listen next week. <laughs> they weren't listening <laughs> anyway uh, yeah we hope to we hope you're around for next week and uh, we certainly will be ourselves yep. but me without potentially without a voice but we'll see anyway right. cheers Nick cheers Dave <laughs> <laughs> and to you our listener cheers, cheers. Thanks, thanks for, for coming. nothing I mean coming <laughs> coming sorry thanks for coming God, that, that did I think we've good. got a new ending there that cheers Dave cheers good. Nick cheers thanks for nothing oh, I like that <laughs> I like that a lot. (laughs) Whiskey and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.